Hi, I'm Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis, and let's continue our discussion about quantum numbers. So we've talked about the de Broglie wavelength, and we've talked about how an electron has wave and particle like properties without getting too terribly in depth uh, for a general chemistry one level it's time to talk about the ramifications of the part of the reading that i'm asking you to do regarding the schrodinger equation namely the quantum numbers so there's going to be three quantum numbers that are going to come from solutions of the uh, wave function and the hamiltonian and jazz like that i'm not going to expect you to do the calculus necessary for this kind of stuff to um, to present itself uh, it's not exactly calculus i guess it's really mostly trig um or you could do it with trig to get most of the quantum numbers out maybe a little calculus that part doesn't matter the part that matters is like i said the what happens from it okay so the first principle the first quantum number is our principal quantum number um, and we've actually already kind of introduced this. So if we think about the Bohr model and we think about that Schrodinger, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Broglie model of that atom, uh, like we presented in previous simulation videos, this is going to be a whole number integer value. Um, with, the, the Bro with, uh, with the Bohr model, we said it was equivalent to the orbit level. With the uh, the Broglie, we still had what kind of looked like an orbit, but now it really wasn't an orbit because we had the electron traveling as a wave. For the final model that we're going to be talking about, the uh, Schrodinger model, the uh, quantum mechanics model of the atom, N is going to represent the principal quantum number. It's always going to have an energy value, uh, or I'm sorry, an, in, yeah, an energy value of one, two, three, etc. So you're never going to have a half number. Again, this goes right back along with the idea of you can't have half a wave. The N is going to give us an idea of the size and also the energy of an orbit. So the bigger the n value is, the more energy the orbit will have. It will also be a bigger orbit. And now because we're talking about this quantum mechanic model, it's time to strike orbit from our lexicon. We're now not talking about orbits, but we're talking about orbitals. Um, and I'm going to give you more a uh, finite picture of what that looks like here in a second. First, we're going to get through these definitions. The next quantum number is going to get the designation of L. So that little line there, that's an L. L is going to be defined as the angular momentum quantum number. It's going to have an energy value of zero, or an integer value of zero all the way up to n minus one. Well, what's n minus one mean? That means, let's say that n is equal to one. L is going to then equal zero, or that's the only number it can equal because n, if n is equal to 1, 1 minus 1 equals 0. But what if n is equal to 2? If n is equal to 2, then 2 minus 1 equals 1. Or we could have a situation of L equals 0. So L could equal 0 or it could equal 1. Um, either one of those values could possibly be correct. Again, we'll give you some more uh, explicit details about how that is going to play in a problem here in a little bit. What does this angular momentum quantum number tell us? Well, plainly speaking, it tells us the shape of an atomic orbital. It's the value that gives us an idea of where an electron might be in space with relationship to a nucleus. So n is always going to be designated to us as a number. We're always going to see uh, the principal quantum number for an electron. It's going to be given to us as a number. L is going to be given to us as a letter. And the different letters uh, have a different value of L that's assigned to them. So if we have an L equals 0, we're always going to give that the letter designation of S. If L is equal 1, then we're going to give it the letter designation of P, 2D, 3F, 4G, so on all the way uh, through the rest of the alphabet. If you run into a letter as you go down the alphabet that you've already used, you just skip that one. Um, 
and then you go on to the next letter. And if you use all of the letters up, then you would start doubling up on the letters. For our periodic table and all the elements that we know of right now, the only values that we need to be worried about are L equals zero, one, two, three, um, and the, the SPDF orbitals. We don't really, there's nothing that we're needing to think about that would be higher than that for our general chemistry course. The other value um, that comes from that Schrodinger equation um, is going to be M sub L. And this is going to be called the magnetic quantum number. It's going to have an integer value that can range from negative L to positive L, including zero. And they're always going to be integers. So let's say that we have an example where N is equal to three for a specific electron, L is equal to two, M sub L, that's how we pronounce that M sub L, M sub L could have an L, or I'm sorry, an, <laughs> because L is equal to two, we could have an M sub L of negative two, negative one, zero, one, or two. What does the magnetic quantum number tell us? It's gonna tell us the orientation in space for our orbitals. Um, and that will make a little bit more sense once we start showing you some pictures regarding the orientation in space bit. Now this value here, this M sub S, the electron spin quantum number, um, the nice thing about this is it's only got two values. It's either positive one half or negative one half. Um, and you may have heard this be called spin up or spin down, depending on the chemistry experience that you've had previously. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, this is going to give us an indication um, to help us understand better discrepancies that we see in emission spectra for atoms. So you probably read in the book that we've got these emission spectra. In fact, that's what our simulation has been showing us when we had those four spectral lines for our hydrogen. Um, those spectral lines, excuse me, for multi-electron systems are, we, we need some way of to account for those. Um, and one thing that M sub S does is it helps us with that. M sub S also, the electron spin, helps us understand the data that comes from experiments uh, where we put a sample in a magnetic field. In fact, if you do a technique called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, MRI, which you may have uh, actually had to have an MRI done uh, on some part of your body, that works off of the electron spin quantum number. What, what do these things mean? We've talked about these definitions. That's fantastic. But what do they really mean? What it's going to give us is a relative location of where an electron is around an atom. So every single electron for any given atom is going to have its own unique set of these four quantum numbers. So we can think about this uh, as this analogy of kind of like a state, city, street, and street number if you were trying to tell someone where you lived. So what state you lived in would dictate or would be given to you by the N principal quantum number um, because that's a pretty nebulous thing to say. I live in Indiana. Sure, Indiana is a fairly big state. Um, compared to something like Rhode Island, um, which is neither a road nor an island. But by telling someone you live in Indiana, you've narrowed down the geography of where they could possibly be. That's helpful. What's more helpful is saying, this is the state I live in and the city I live in. Now that city is going to be our angular quantum number, that L value. Cities are good, Cities can be pretty big. Say you live in the city of Indianapolis. So saying you live in Indiana and in Indianapolis, it narrows it down, but maybe not enough. Telling someone the street you live on is even better. And that's like saying our magnetic quantum number, that M sub L. That's going to narrow it down even more where we're going to find an electron. So we have N state, L city, M sub L street. Now, if you want to get more specific yet, you're going to tell somebody the street number. So like, what's the number on the mailbox outside the house? 
that's going to be like our m sub s value, that spin quantum number. So every electron is going to have its own unique set of these four quantum numbers. How is this going to look uh, and how is this going to help us ex explain anything um, with a better model of the atom? Okay, back to the simulation. So right now we have a situation where um, we've got this thing in red, which is going to be our nucleus still. And now instead of having rings uh, that are with the white dots, kind of like the orbits from the Bohr model, and instead of having the orbits and the uh, string, uh, or I'm sorry, the wave from the uh, de Broglie model, we now have this kind of nebulous space, this like blue highlighting. We're going to say this is where the electron is. So we can't pinpoint it exactly. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle coming into play. So the electron is somewhere in this general vicinity. If it interacts with a photon of light, it can be energized up to a higher orbital, uh, a higher energy level, n equals, in the case of what you're seeing right now, n equals 6. But, and I'm going to get out of the screen here to make this a little bit clearer, not only do we now have to be thinking about the energy levels n, we need to be thinking about our other quantum numbers. S specifically, what about the L? We said L was going to give us the shape of our orbital. So now we have a situation where we've got n equals 1, but we also have these other blanks, these areas where the electron can go. It doesn't have to just go up and down one column here. We actually have other columns that we can land in. And if we go into these other areas, we're going to see the shape of where the electron can go. Like here's an example. Now we're on the x plane, right? And then now it looks like a donut. So if we follow the electron on what's happening over on our electron energy level diagram, we can see that the electron is going up in energy, but it's, and we know that by its change in n value, we also see that by changing l, it's changing the shape of the orbital it's in. And that orbital is giving us an idea of where we can expect to find an electron at any given point in time. It's not telling us exactly where the electron is, but it's saying, hey, you're probably gonna find the electron somewhere in here. Now, one thing that you might notice here at the bottom is that we have these three sets of coordinates, this n, l, and m. So this m sub l is our orientation in space. Um, and so sometimes we're going to see these orbits uh, go along the x-axis. Sometimes they're going to go on the z-axis, so up and down. And the y-axis is really coming in and out of the uh, screen at you. So we could watch this for quite a while to go through all the different kinds of shapes of orbitals that we might expect to see, or we can uh, go a little bit quicker and we can show you what some of these are. Here again, electrons have their own unique set of quantum numbers. Each orbital is only going to be able to hold two electrons in it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why that is uh, as we when we do an example problem. Here is this nice little table that gives you all a large number of n values, the possible l values that you can have for that corresponding n. So for example, if n is equal to 1, the only value of l you can have is 0. If n is equal to 2, well, then you could have an l of 0 or an l equal 1. If n is equal to 3, you could have l equal 0, 1, or 2. So you have these three options. And if it's 4, 0, 1, 2, and 3, this subshell designation, and I nicely misspelled that, this is going to give you the uh, N and L information, how we normally write it out. So 1 corresponding to N, S corresponding to 0 for L, because an L equals 0 means S. If we go down to N equals 2, 2, 0 means 2 
S. So we have the 2S subshell. 2,1 is the 2P subshell because if L is equal to 1, then we give it the letter P. So this is the 2P subshell. This is the 2S subshell. 3, the one of note would be if L is equal to 2, we have a 3D subshell. We can have a 3P, we can have a 3S. That totally is fine because that follows the rules that we laid out at the beginning of this video. What are our possible values of M sub L? If we have S, that means L is equal to 0. M sub L by definition is plus or minus L including 0. Well, if L is 0, then M sub L can only equal 0. So M sub L is equal to 0 for this case. If we have L equals 1, then we have a situation where we can actually have some fun. Because now M sub L can equal negative 1, 0, or 1. So we have three different possible M sub L values. We have three different magnetic uh, quantum number values. So the language we would use here is to say we have three orbitals in the subshell. So for our 2P subshell, we have three orbitals within that subshell. So this corresponds to an orbital, this corresponds to an orbital, and this corresponds to an orbital. This, the number of M sub L values is going to tell you how many orbitals you have. And this very final column is going to say, here's our number, number of orbitals total within the shell. The shell is referring back to what's that N value. So here we have one for the 2s subshell, we have three orbitals in our 2p subshell for a total of four orbitals in the principal quantum number 2 shell. We've got this wonderful information in the graph. Fantastic. What does that tell us? Quite a bit, actually. So using the Schrodinger equation, um, what we would, if, if I was going to ask you to do that math, and I'm not going to ask you to do that math, what it can give you is an idea of where you would expect to find an electron. So in the case of a 1s subshell, um, these dots here designate uh, a probability of finding an electron around the nucleus. Now note, that doesn't look like it's a solid shell. We're just saying, hey, there's a chance of finding the electron. And where we've got more dots, we have a better chance of finding the electron. For a 2s subshell, now we have a situation where we're going to have a center and we're going to have this ring around it. So this thing in between uh, these two areas of density, we're going to, or these areas of probability, we're going to say is a node. And remember our definition of a node is that we don't have any, uh, uh, we, we're not finding the string there. The wave isn't moving there. In the case of an electron and the quantum uh, stuff that we're talking about, we're saying that this node has zero probability of finding an electron here. So we can find an electron here, we can find it here, but we're not going to find it here in the middle. For our 3s, we now have one, two, three spots where we can find electrons uh, based off of this probability but we're not going to find them in any of those nodes right here. Now, most of the time, we're going to draw our orbitals like what we see here, uh, where they are going to be these filled shells, uh, or these filled circles. And these contour probabilities, really, are they're usually defined as like the 90% chance of finding an electron somewhere within this space. Um, so, yeah, we might have a chance of finding an electron somewhere outside of this thing, but 90% of the time, 95% of the time, we're going to find the electron within here. In the case of a 2s, we're still going to have a situation where we have a node. It's just now, if we looked on the outside of our 2s, um, it would just look like this blue shell. It's not really truly blue, but we wouldn't see that little area in the middle. It's up to us to know that it really exists. I like to think of these uh, orbitals like this when they're drawn out kind of like gobstoppers. It's a candy that I really enjoy, and it has multiple layers. Um, and so these different layers do exist even though I can't see them. I have to know that they're there. This radial probability plot, you're going to see one in your book. 
read over that pretty quickly. The punchline here is this is just on the x-axis, the distance from the nucleus, and then the probability of finding an electron. And as you can see for something uh, like a smaller orbital with n equals one versus two versus three, the probability of finding an electron is really high. It's whatever the tallest peak is close to the nucleus when n equals one, it's further out with n equals two, and it's further out yet with n equals three. Now I mentioned with our m sub l values that we had three uh, orbitals within the 2p subshell, and here they are. Here's a situation where we have these things oriented differently in space. So if we have a coordinate diagram like we've got here, an x, a y, and a z axis, they're kind of canny. Uh, the, the x and the y are kind of supposed to be drawn out three dimensionally here to make them a little bit easier to see. What we've got is if we solve those equations I'm not asking you to solve, we end up with these three distinct shapes of orbitals. So we might think of, and this is not really a way to do it, uh, strictly speaking, but it's a good way to start thinking about it. If L is equal to one, and then the M sub L could be negative one, zero, and one, well, this one right here, this 2px, we might think of uh, as, well, this could be m sub l equals negative 1, and this could be m sub l equals 0, and this is m sub l equals 1. So we have what we like to call a p orbital, and this is the shape of a p orbital. It's kind of like a dumbbell, uh, the two little lobes. Uh, right next to one another here. And you're gonna notice the one is orange and one is this teal. They do have different shadings and that's going to be that's going to be there because again of information from the Schrodinger equation. At this point in time I want you to know that these are uh, we would say they have different phases um, and they do have different colors there. For something that's more complicated, like a d orbital, you end up drawing out these kinds of things. And uh, I like to tell my inorganic class that these are the uh, uh, little uh, four-leaf clover looking orbitals, except for this guy. This one is a p orbital that likes to do the hula hoop or has a donut around its waist. Um, this is from coming from the fact that now we have 3d. d corresponds to l equals 2. If l is equal to 2, m sub l can be 2, 1, 0, negative 1, and negative 2. So we could have 2, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2. So however many values of m sub l we have, that corresponds to the number of orbitals we would expect to find. Here's a nice little diagram that also shows you not only the shapes of these things. So this is the S category. Notice how they look just like a nice little uh, sphere. The P's, which look like this dumbbell thing here, they're just oriented on either the Y, the Z, or the X axis. Here's our D's that we just showed you. See, that looks a lot more like a clover right there. Uh, and down here at the bottom are our f orbitals. So we have seven f orbitals, and that's coming from f, where l is equal, three, equal to three. So personally, I enjoy looking at this version uh, of the uh, periodic table, not so much because it tells me anything, but it just, it's nice, uh, I mean, it tells me uh, shape information, but that's pretty much it. It does remind me that I've got this layering kind of thing that happens as I go down the periodic table with these various orbitals. Um, but basically what I hope that you get from this is the general shapes of the S, the D, and the P orbitals, and roughly where they are going to be important on the periodic table. When we get into writing out orbital diagrams, this, is, this part's gonna make a lot more sense. This has been a lot of information about atomic orbitals. You might need to watch this video a couple of times, and you're probably going to have to read the, through the book a few times on this as well. Uh, it's very few the person who ever learned uh, this kind of stuff, like about atomic orbitals and the like, and it made sense the very first time. So this has been pretty quick. 
And like I have said so many times, but I mean it every single time, if you have any questions, please let me know and I will do my best to help you out. Thanks.